it's a great pleasure to be back here in this particular room. Thank you for invitation here, because I never had a lecture in, in this institute actually, since I left it uh, 43 years ago. Uh, I'm trying to read my talk because I was strictly uh, uh, told that I have only 30 minutes and as an old university teacher, if I start to digress on the pictures, I would never finish my talk. So, uh, I apologize for reading, but I try to be uh, also uh, interactive in some of the, the slides that I will show. First of all, I would like to point out this is a picture that the library of the, uh, uh, this institute helped me to trace, a picture made by one of the great Polish uh, photographers, Marek Holzmann. And for people who knew Konarski, they immediately recognized his characteristics, expression and face, and his pointing finger. So if you see that he is waving his finger during my talk, let me know, because this is what, what the sign that I'm doing something wrong. The monograph, Integrative Activity of the Brain, has been commissioned as a personal invitation to Professor Konowski, issued in 1963 by University of Chicago Press. The book was finished three years later and published in 1967. The Polish edition was published in 1969 and Russian translation in 1970. Um, I was just briefly flashed uh, the three editions. Uh, in fact, a, the Polish edition had an extensive introduction as well as Russian edition that gave me some of the information that I would use in my lecture. The book was an attempt to summarize the current state of knowledge on motivational and cognitive processes and presented a new theory of classical instrumental condition. I will describe the background of the book and Konorski's motivation for writing it, then briefly introduce the book itself and present some of the central and new ideas. Finally, I'll try to evaluate the importance of the book for the present day in your science. When the book was published in 1967, it did not receive much attention. Indeed, only a handful of reviews appeared in scientific journals. One significant factor might have been a rapid development of new methods in neurobiology which brought a wealth of new findings, difficult to predict when the book was being written. Konowski was clearly aware of fast accumulating knowledge, how the nervous system functions on the cellular level and within a specific neuronal systems. He called this new development in brain science an analytical approach. This was clearly not his goal. Konowski's main motivation to write the book was to present the overall picture how the brain works, very ambitious. Uh, he named this method an integrative approach, and in fact, the title of the book was carefully chosen and was a clear reference to immensely influential book written by Charles Sherrington uh, 60 years before, The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. Sherrington's book summarized uh, information about integrative active activity of the spinal cord and the motor system in the brain. The other possible factor for the lack of attention to Konorsky's book might have been quite common skepticism toward any grand theory in physiology. In fact, general physiology at the time was focused on specific functional system and it was little concern how the organism works as one entity. This was also true about brain research. Another aspect of worth mentioning might have been the fact that Konorsky's book was not an easy reading. It required from the start a certain level of knowledge of the uh, anatomical organization of the nervous system and some familiarity with the Pavlovian terminology. Several years later, Konorsky wrote in his autobiography that the book probably had too much information and it should have been written in, as a two-volume set. Previous Konorsky book, which made him famous, uh, was the Conditioned Reflexes in Neuronal Organization, published in 1948. 
Since that time, a substantial body of new research has been accumulated by Konarski and his colleagues. However, most of this work was not widely known, since it was published in Acta Biologia Experimentalis, Journal of Nancy Institute, with then a very restricted circulation. The Department of Neurophysiology moved to a new building at Pasteur Street in 1955. And the first few years, it was a period of intense research activity. The department consisted of several more or less independent research teams covering a wide range of neurobiological research. Political changes in Poland in 1955 made possible traveling abroad and brought to Nenski Institute a number of visiting scientists from the West and the East. In 1957, Professor Konowski was invited to the United States, and to his pleasant surprise, he found out that his monograph from 1948 was well known and treasured by behavioral psychologists from several leading universities. This visit allowed Konowski to establish scientific contact with brain research in institutions in USA, Canada, and shortly after, with a number of scientists in England and other European countries. Professor Konowski became a well-known figure in America, and in 1963, he was elected as a foreign member of the National Academy of Science, to my knowledge, the only Polish scientist at that time. Probably the most important motivation to write the book was the fact that there were several new findings made by senior researchers at the department that had a direct implication for the theory of type 2 condition. The theory which was practically unchanged since, since the first discoveries made by Pinochet and Miller in the late 20s, and described in a series of papers early, in the early 70s. I will mention only some of those results. Rosalinda Vervitska, in a series of her studies by like two conditioned responses, have shown that in order to explain instrumental condition, it was necessary to include activity of the, of the motivational center, which participates in forming associations between conditioned stimulus and motor response. When such association is established, activation of the center would elicit a conditioned response, while the lesions of the center would make it uh, impossible or very difficult to, uh, to form a new response. Professor Kulitska was able to localize motivational centers for hunger and thirst in the latter hypothalamus. As I mentioned, she worked with unusual animal, the goats, and when I first appeared as a student in this institute, there were several goats. A, on the lawn of the institute with some strange electrodes out of the brain. Then the second important finding was a, a came out from the work of Stefan Sotich. Experiments of, of Stefan Sotich suggested that motivational centers in hypothalamus have two independent uh, centers or uh, as he called it, uh, hunger and satiation center. The hunger center was responsible for motivation drive, and satiation center was responsible for consummatory response. So this showed in his experiment that activation of the drive center by direct stimulation would elicit a conditioned response, while the activation of Consumatory center was induced by presentation of food, of food reward. The next important discovery was made in the laboratory of Eszpeta Jankowska and Teresa Gruska. They found that afferent input from the movement, dog pole, was not necessary for acquiring and performing the type 2 condition response. This finding were a serious challenge to original theory of Konowski Miller, suggesting that association between cortical centers representing movement and conditioned stimulus was the basis of acquiring type 2 conditioned responses. In the light of those new results, it was clear that the combination of type 2 instrumental conditioning needed major revision. Likewise, new findings on the organization of motivational centers in the hypothalamus called for a revision 
of traditional view of the reward and punishment in classical and instrumental condition. At the same time, Konoski was very aware of what was going on in modern neuroscience. There was a new set of data coming from laboratories using single unit recording in visual cortex. Those were first started by Bernard Broncastle and then later developed by uh, David Huber and Thorsten Wies. Konorsky keenly followed those developments and on the basis of this new knowledge about the visual system as well as his long time interest in perceptual deficit following localization, localized lesions in human patients, he uh, formulated a new theory of functional organization of all sensory systems. To sum up my introductory comments, it is clear that by early 60s, research activity in the department produced a substantial body of new results which required some kind of synthesis and in cooperation to a bigger picture. However, uh, there was no direct possibility uh, to, to do that without writing more extensive work, and this was the uh, the book that Ekonowski written. So I can conclude that the invitation from Chicago University Press to write the book was timely and Ekonowski was ready for the task. I will just make a brief presentation of the book and I will try to cut out some of my talk because I see that I will be running out of time. The book consisted of 30 chapters the first chapter describes basic activities of the, of the uh, brain and the next four chapters describe a perceptual theory and we'll hear more about this from other speakers. The sixth, sixth chapter that were a core of the book were dealing with such subjects like classical condition, internal inhibition, instrumental condition and presented an overall model including the new findings and uh, other uh, theories or speculation of Kenorsky about the mechanism of conditioning. <coughs> In the first chapter of the book, Kenorsky introduced several new concepts describing basic activities of, of the organism. Two new con concepts were introduced. Preparatory and consumatory activity. The first form of activity consisted of behaviors that provide organisms with necessary stimuli and allow avoiding harmful and unpleasant stimuli. The second form of activity is a reflexive, unconditioned response of the organism to presence of biologically important stimuli like food or pain. Both preparatory and consumatory activities could be either preservative or protective. This created a quartet of different reflexes that Konorsky described in the An example of preservative alimentary activity, I think I have, was that uh, uh, presented Konorsky in the form of block diagram. This is one of the, his assumptions that he should not go into details of anatomical structure, but present most of the, his theories in, as a block diagram. The, the block diagram describing hunger association system had such important points. There is an independent center for hunger and cessation. Those centers are localized in the lateral hypothalamus, uh, sorry, in the lateral and medial hypothalamus respectively. Those centers have two levels. One level that is responsible for consumatory response, what is, I mentioned before, hardwired unconditioned response. And the second level, both for hunger and cessation, is the uh, center that is responsible for preparatory responses, where the association between unconditioned and conditioned dominant take place. The same way he used the model of fear and relief with, without closer localization, because there was no data uh, at that time. And he suggested that fear and relief are two antagonistic centers, again localized somewhere in the hypothalamus. And the lower level is the consumatory center, and the higher level of the whole system is the uh, uh, 
the level where, where the association between condition and condition is uh, um, to take place. <coughs> this is one of the important things, because in the introduction, uh, Konorski said that he will use block diagrams as a conceptual uh, models for the systems. And this was sometimes used as an argument that because he did not try to find more detailed anatomic information, that the models were sort of constructed and uh, conceptual. Konorski did not consider conceptual as a negative uh, evaluation. <coughs> I will just summarize what is, what is important in this model. What seems to be still relevant and important today is Konoski's attempt to define motivational activities of the organism as strict, in strictly physiological terms. The other significant contribution is defining motivational system in terms of antagonistic organization of the drive and anti-drive. That is to say that for each motivational state of the organism, there must be antagonistic state or a process that inhibits the state, original state of activity, and brings the system to the equilibrium. The later process, defined as anti-drive, became an orphan concept of Konorsky theory that regrettably has not been adopted by most of the neuroscientists. The number of important findings in the last decade have confirmed that at least for hunger sensation, there are separate modulators that, that are directed either to the hunger center or cessation there, and they will modulate independently these two opposite processes. The next part of the book uh, takes, takes a, 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 uh, that his, describes his most uh, developed theory of agnostic units. We'll hear more today, so I'll be short about uh, this in, uh, part of the book. Uh, in my opinion, this is the, the boldest and most, uh, I would say, visionary part of the book, where he described the uh, organization of sensory system and extends <coughs> information that was obtained at that time by other <coughs> researchers on the visual system to all other sensory systems. <coughs> as I mentioned before, based on new electrophysiological findings of Hugo Levisel about sequential and hierarchical organization of the visual cortex, Konorsky applied those findings to the sensory system and proposed a uniform organization for all sensory systems. The core of this model was the separation of transit units which are elements of sequential processing of sensory information from the agnostic units, which represent biologically meaningful stimulus patterns. Konorsky wrote that although there was no direct electrophysiological evidence that perceptions and represent, re, represented by single units are existing in the brain, he uh, was convinced that there is enough indirect evidence to postulate that such units indeed exist in the brain. The hypothesis of that human perception is a unitary phenomenon was based on the argument that we perceive individual objects, places, animals, faces, and so on, as a single perceptual experience. And on this additional effort, one can detect elements which comprise those perceptual items. In the next chapter, and I will just show briefly, those are the uh, categories of visual uh, um, gnostic units. It means that functional elements that represent particular perceptual objects. I understand why you see a goat. Hmm? <laughs> goat. Yes, goat. you see the goat. <laughs> It was the animal of the house, like dog or cat. Um, so uh, he systematically shows, it, it goes through all perceptions in vision, audition, somesthetics, and kinesthetic, and in fact in emotions, which now just he introduced it as a perceptual object, and presented what we called 
the conceptual map of Gnostic units. As you can see, there is no uh, a relation of the size of the Gnostic units to the size of the cortex. There is no relation between exact position of those Gnostic fields, that means the fields that contain Gnostic units, to the uh, Brodmann set of architectonic map of human cortex that was uh, already uh, almost 100 years old. I modified a little bit this slide uh, from the book, adding the shade of color to the primary sensory areas and association areas. But as you see, in yellow are visual gnostic units, in green and light green uh, are somatostatic gnostic units, auditory are in bluish color, and in red, kinesthetic uh, uh, units. What I think is important in the uh, in Konorsky theory is that Konorsky pointed out, in contrast to the other sensory system, kinesthetic gnosis is based on stimuli produced internally by integrated patterns of movement. The other unique trait of Konorsky analysis was a central position of language in sensory systems. Konorsky <coughs> made it very clear that language is a specific form of human behavior and that sensory aspect of language must have specific representation in, within each of the sensory systems. This implied a hemispheric lateralization of Gnostic categories involved in perception, in generation of speech, in writing, reading, just leaving the other hemisphere for non-verbal associations. The next uh, figure that I would like to show, I'm sorry, this is Ignorsky reviews in two chapters all possible sensory associations and he presents this review in form of circular diagrams where he takes careful visual uh, gnostic fields and looks at the all possible association with auditory, somatosensory, sensory and kinesthetic uh, um, gnostic units. So those are associations between those two. And here I would like to just add as a, a, a little comment. Having theory of the agnostic unit made possible to look at the association <laughs> as a relation between the agnostic elements. So then one can look at all possible connections between one sensory system and other sensory system. As I said, he also introduced the fifth diagram introducing Gnostic units of emotional behavior and look at the association of this unit with sensory systems. <clears throat> I would show it a little bit here and, and uh, this part because we will hear from other speakers about that sensory. Um, Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, then I will be really very short. Uh, the next uh, chapters, the next six chapters, consist the core of the book, as I mentioned. There are a, a very detailed discussions of the classical condition, internal inhibition, uh, defensive or, and elementary instrumental condition. So Kinoski goes systematically through all the previous literature and brings the new, new data from the laboratory. Uh, to <coughs> construct the final model, which is very important in understanding of his new theory of the instrumental condition. This model includes the dry center, which is important for, as we said, for activation of the animal, and representation of the dry center, which is the place where it comes association between neutral and conditioned stimuli. But in order to explain the choice of the instrumental response, he introduced a concept of central motor behavioral system. And I would like to read this because it's an extremely important aspect of, of his theory. Konoski introduced a new concept of central motor behavioral system that includes all behavioral, innate, and acquired movements of the organism. Those are movements that are at disposal of the organism at a given period of time. It means that 
they will be enriched by the experience. There are two major implications of this model. One, that only those movements can be instrumentalized, which are mediated by the central behavior system, that is movement performed by organs itself. And the other implication was that the given motor act has unitary character. No perceptual feedback is needed to perform and condition this movement. This again is uh, against the previous theory that, uh, uh, of the instrumental condition that association and form between motor representation of the movement and uh, sensory stimuli. Again, I would like to point out one of the uh, chapters which is very important. The chapter, the, the 12th chapter, one of the last chapters of the book, is dealing with complex subject of transient memory. Konorski and his collaborators studied this problem for many years. They developed special tests for studying transient memory in dogs and monkeys and made a significant contribution in search of brain structure involved in this form of memory. Regrettably, much of this work has been forgotten or misunderstood. Unlike most of the researchers of his time, Konoski believed the process of transit memory were not related to an initial unlabeled phase preceding the consolidation process, uh, forming permanent memory. For Konoski, the major function of transit memory <coughs> was to maintain temporary tra traces for their immediate utilization. Transient memory traces need not to be consolidated, according to Gnosky. In fact, they appear and disappear depending on behavior of the members. One such common demand is planning behavior, where transient memory provides program for future tasks. Gnosky called this function a prospective memory. The other behavioral demand is remembering of the already completed actions to avoid their repetitions. The function of transient memory was this function was named by Gnorski a retrospective memory. And I'll just summarize my talk if I can have that. Um, to summarize my short presentation, I'll try to point out some of the important ideas developed by Gnorski, which in my opinion <coughs> have not lost their significance for modern time neuroscience. First idea, Konoski theory that basic motivational activities are reciprocally antagonistic tandem of drive and underdrive. The main point of this theory is that they are some that are two opposite physiological processes to ensure motivation of the critical. Both of them consist of innate, hardwired and acquired functions. Without knowing the mechanisms controlling the level of fear, aggression, sexual drive, or drug addiction, we are still enslaved by all thinking in physiology, encapsulated in saying what is going up has to go down. In my opinion, Konorsky's theory of motivation is worth of revisiting by present-day neuroscientists. Second idea, Konorsky's theory of Gnostic units and organizational sensory systems. This theory has been known only for a handful of sensory physiologists. In modern cognitive terms, gnostic units will be called representational processes. According to Konorsky, gnostic units provide a neural substrate of sensory object and allow forming cross-model sensory association. Gnostic units, as envisioned by Konorsky, enhance memory capability and provide essential operational elements for transient memory. And the last, the third idea, Konoski understood that the human, human language is the ultimate form of mental representation. For Konoski, language was the highest level of sensory cognitive processes and at the same time a complex form of behavior. Konoski's profound knowledge of clinical neuropsychology gave him many insights into organization, function, language, and human brain. Regrettably, in his book, Konoski did not provide more general or biological model of human memory. It is difficult to speculate from the perspective of 45 years why Konoski's book has been overlooked or even forgotten. Perhaps it was the conceptual nature of his theories 
as well as almost complete lack of anatomical data in his blog style. Uh, and this might have contributed to, to uh, negligence or forgetting of this uh, book or the models he presented. By the time the book was finished, there was an uh, enormous uh, increase in our knowledge about organizational nervous systems. And uh, especially a few years later, when the methods for visualization of living brain developed, some of the Konorsky theory could have been verified experimentally. Uh, to finish, I would like to uh, came with an irresistible philosophical uh, thought after looking at the book and Gnosis's life. The great achievement in science came only, come only with a passionate uh, commitment and a great power of thinking. Gnosis had both. Thank you for your attention.